Hi, today we're going to be taking a look at this oscilloscope. It's a McSig STO1004 and this is a portable oscilloscope as you can see. And this one was provided to us today for this review by the UK distributor for McSig products, Talonic Instruments. Talonic have a wide range of test equipment and power supplies on their website. Uh, this is the digital oscilloscopes section. And at the bottom here, we've got the Mixig STO1004. So let's have a look at the product in detail. The unit's priced at about £670, including VAT. So certainly not the cheapest oscilloscope out there, and it's not going to compete with the very low-end Rigol and Siglent scopes. But the pricing seems to match the feature set uh, with what we've got here is 100 megahertz bandwidth, four channels, one giga samples per second and a memory depth of 70 mega points. Now it doesn't seem to have segmented memory so that appears to be the only weakness with this unit. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of IO ports which we'll look at in a moment um, and we've also got the quite large 8 inch display on here with a resolution of 800 by 600 pixels. The unit can be powered from the mains through a power pack but it also has a battery pack which gives it around five hours life and I actually got about five hours 20 minutes from it before it started uh, telling me it needed to be charged immediately. We've got some internal storage 32 gigabytes and also protocol decoding including as standard so UART CAN, LIN, SPI and I2C. We get the rechargeable battery included with the unit as well as the AC adapter for either charging or permanent powering and then we also get four probes suitable for that 100 megahertz bandwidth. So that's what you get in the box. Let's take a closer look at the unit itself. Right, so it took around 30 seconds for the unit to boot up and basically the HDMI output was active almost from the start. And one thing that you can see also is there's basically no delay between the display and what's being shown on the HDMI output, which means that you could use the HDMI port as your primary display. For example, if you plug this into your large monitor on your bench, plugged a mouse into the USB port on the right hand side, you could use all of the functionality there without having to actually touch the oscilloscope itself and just have the probes connected. So if you prefer to work that way, that would work quite nicely. Now, one thing that I found with the user interface is it does take a little bit of getting used to. When you're so used to the Keysight scopes uh, or even the uh, Rigol scopes, you know where everything is. And the first thing that I have trouble with is where is the trigger menu because there's a, a trigger button here but it doesn't take you into the menu to show you where to trigger. Uh, so you can do two things, you can either press the menu button here or you can swipe down from the top uh, and when you swipe down from the top you've got all the various options for the system so it's worth remembering uh, that gesture. You go to trigger and then we've got things like edge triggering uh, on channel 1 with the rising edge. If we swipe that back out of the way you can see it's triggered. Now the other thing is um, here is the trigger level shown in yellow and I thought you'd just be able to move this up and down but in fact it moves the entire waveform up and down. What you have to do is click on level and then you've got this swipey bar which you can move up and down which I think is a little bit counterintuitive and then you have to kind of get rid of that. It would much more uh, easily be used if on this side if you moved up and down that moved the waveform but on this side you move the trigger level but at the moment as it stands it just moves the entire waveform no matter where you press on the screen. Now what you can see is we've got a good high resolution display it's very clear to see exactly what's going on um, as I said you bring down most of the options from the menu at the top so things like uh, measurements so we can uh, have a look at the frequency for example uh, and we can also um, let's do the duty cycle and we move that out of the way. Now we do need to zoom out a little bit because these measurements are taken from the waveform on the display so we need to change the time base so that we have at least uh, one cycle in there and now we can see we're putting 500 hertz in and our duty cycle is around 10%. That's uh, actually the signal generator that we were using for testing the LED drivers. So these are nice and clear on here and obviously depending on the colour uh, that shows you which channel it's assigned to. So if we come down again from the top and we pick channel 2 and then we want to measure the frequency of that as well. Now that appears at the bottom in that turquoisey colour 10, 10.1 kilohertz. It does vary a little bit as I said these measurements 
uh, are not done through like a counter mechanism. These are done based on what's available to see on the display. Uh, then on the right hand side, we've got the channel options. So at the moment we're on channel two here. We can pick whichever channel we're interested in um, setting up. And we've got the coupling options, DC, AC, ground as usual. The probe type. Now the probes that come with this unit are fixed at 10 times. Uh, which is pretty standard. That's how you'd normally use your oscilloscope probes. These are set to one at the moment because I've directly attached the oscilloscope to a signal generator just with some BNC cables. You've got your options for the bandwidth. You can also uh, change the V-scaling reference and also give each channel a label. So there's some preset labels here, but you can also type in your own label. So I've called that one sine wave, and as you can see on the display there, it's come up sine wave. Uh, now what you can also see is the channel buttons are illuminated with the colour that matches the display which is quite nice. So that makes it nice and clear what's doing what. So in terms of other user interface features, now as I said you can move the waveform up and down but it doesn't want to snap to certain numbers very easily. So if you want to set this to 1.5 it's a little bit tricky to do so. So we've got the up down buttons here which are fine adjustment and they just move it up and down in small steps. We've got a save button here which does a screenshot and saves it to internal memory for us to uh, view later or transfer to a PC or something like that. We've got the time base then in the centre which we can move up and down as you would do with a normal oscilloscope but a nice thing here is if you press the button in the middle then you get a whole selection of time bases to pick from quickly so you can very easily switch between different time bases so we could put at one second uh, and end up getting that rolling display and then if we wanted to quickly move to something more fine we can select 100 microseconds and get back to the screen very quickly so it's really nice having that ability there to move to different time bases in a very rapid uh, way like this uh, then we've got a chx button which is uh, whichever channel that you want selected so channel one or channel two to be the active channel and then we've got our cursors so horizontal cursors now this one does move up and down if you select in the right place. Um, so here's the cursor at the bottom here and then Y1 at the top. And you automatically get some measurements here as you can see on the display uh, saying peak to peak is around 2.98 volts etc. So uh, cursors are very easy to use. Again the same kind of thing on the vertical ones we can move those around and get some basic measurements up on the screen very quickly. Going back to that menu at the top, uh, as I mentioned, we've got the various measurements that we can do. We can do time or voltage, amplitude, uh, depends what it is that you're measuring. But we've also got the counter. So as I said, the frequency here is being measured based on the waveform that's on display. But we've also got hardware counter. So if we select channel 2 here and move the menu out of the display, you can see this is using a proper frequency measurement. It's locked on to 10 kilohertz, even though this one is moving around a little bit as this moves in and out of uh, complete cycles on the display. Now as well as the measurements we've got another menu here which says save and we can choose whether we're saving to the local storage memory or a USB disk. Uh, we can give it a specific name and save it from this menu directly and we can choose the type of file type that we're creating so we can create a WAV file, a comma separated variable file, a binary and we can also save it to uh, different locations here and then there's the settings so we can save uh, configurations of the oscilloscope. So if you're switching between projects and you had various different probes connected, you could just recover those settings very quickly. And we've also got um, the picture saving. So that's just a snapshot of the screen. And if we wanted to, we can include a timestamp. And we can also inverse the color. So if we're printing it out on a printer directly, we don't print an entire page of black with the colored waveforms. You can turn it into a white background with the waveforms on top of it. Then we've got some of the acquire options here. So we can choose the uh, mode that we're going to acquire the waveform. So we could do averaging on it. So um, if you're getting a particularly noisy waveform, but it's a repetitive waveform, you can do some averaging, some envelopes some peak detection. And we could also choose the memory depth for the unit. Now, when it's set to automatic, it actually just records the maximum for all of the channels. Obviously, as you have more channels, uh, then that starts to eat up the available memory for each of the individual channels. Uh, then we've got the display, so we can uh, draw as dots if we want to, which is every individual sample point, or we can draw vectors. Uh, we've got things like the background, um, gratitude, or the grid, 
and we can change the intensity of that and that shows up more or less it's actually better with the grid slightly more visible here uh, we can also have persistence as well uh, and then under common it's got a few things like the references we can also change between xy mode or uh, amplitude and time now the triggering options are quite comprehensive there's a lot of options on here we've got our standard edge triggering uh, but we can also trigger on pulse width we can do triggering on logic functions which allows us to combine uh, various functions on all of the channels uh, we've got it on um, n edge runt slope and also timeout so lots of options here for trigger on auto here is our auto ranging and auto setting options um, so obviously, like most oscilloscopes, if you press auto, it will uh, do its best to try and trigger on the waveform so that you get the clearest display. Uh, and these are some of the options here that we've got around that, including turning off channels that are unused. Uh, that's using the auto channel detection uh, rather than just leaving them all active. Uh, and then there's a few things like factory reset and adjustments, which I don't think we want to fiddle with. So those are all the basic functions of the oscilloscope, very similar to any type of desktop scope, but in this portable form factor. We've also got the maths function, so we can scroll up on the right hand side, or you can press the math button here. And we press this and it starts giving us some waveforms and we scroll across here to see what it's actually doing. So first of all, we've got basic stuff like addition, subtraction, multiplication and division of any of the four channels. So you can do any combination of these, you can add one channel to itself. Uh, you can add channel 1 to channel 2 or channel 3, for example. And then you can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division. Then we've got FFT, and we can do that as uh, line or in decibels on any of the four channels. And we can choose whichever window is most appropriate for uh, the FFT function that we want to do. Then we've got AX plus B, and we can choose the um, values for A and B here. Uh, and then we've got advanced math where you can actually put in a mathematical function or an expression, set what the variables are, and it will calculate that from the waveform in real time. So some nice options there uh, for the math function. We've also got reference. So what you can do here is save a reference waveform and have that in the background. And then you can use that to um, compare it to the waveform that you're getting, for example. So it can be quite useful with diagnostics. If you've stored a bunch of waveforms which show what the um, communications waveform for example should look like then you can bring it up in the background line it up and if it doesn't line up you know you've got a problem uh, so that can be quite handy and then we've got our serial decoders so we've got s1 and s2 you can decode two serial channels at the same time and here are our options so uart lin can spi i squared c uh, and 429 and 1553 one, five, uh, and then you can choose which channel you're receiving it on uh, the polarity of the idle level, uh, we can do parity checking, we choose how many bits from 5 to 9 and also the board rate. So I've connected channel 4 up to a USB to UART converter and if I type some numbers into the terminal you can see they actually get decoded properly so we've got the, um, the actual oscilloscope waveform but we've also got the numbers that are being decoded. Now that's in ASCII. If we go across to the decoder options uh, we've got UART channel 4, idle level is high, uh, and then we've got uh, the board rate and then the display. So we can also display that as hex if we get that out of the way. And when we type stuff up, we get the hexadecimal representation of that. And as we zoom in and out, uh, the bar matches the width of the waveform. Now this can be a little bit of a problem because if we zoom out too far, let's say we want to see lots of data all at once, it gets to the point where that data disappears but there is a, a tabular way of viewing the UART data. If we go to serials text um, you can see here uh, S1 UART it's showing both the hex and the ASCII representation of the data that I'm typing in and it's not missing any of those. It's able to read all of them even though you couldn't see them on the oscilloscope display itself and it also tells you the error rate if you enable things like parity uh, but if we get this out of the way uh, we've got various options here and you can see the check here if this had uh, odd or even parity and I'd enabled that on the transmitter then it would be able to uh, tell you if that was in error and we've got all these different options for the different serial decoders so we can look at CAN data and that's where something like this becomes quite useful because because it's in a compact form factor 
you could actually take this out to your vehicle, plug it onto the CAN bus, uh, and then you could see what's going on there, have a look at the decoded data and make sure it makes sense. Um, obviously, it doesn't do the, the decoding of the protocol on top of the CAN layer, uh, but we'd be able to see if something was basically wrong with the wiring in a car, for example. So that's where uh, a little portable scope like this makes quite a lot of uh, sense, and also with the serial decoders, it makes things a lot easier to work with. So that's Serial Decoder 1, and Serial Decoder 2 is exactly the same, so it's an exact replica. You can even decode the same channel, potentially at a different board rate or something like that, if you were switching board rates during communication, which can be quite handy. Um, so again, you can completely independently decode another channel, and you don't have to have that channel displayed on the waveform. So if you want to, you can turn that channel off from being displayed, and it will still uh, decode uh, those numbers in the background. Now the tablet itself does run Android, so it does have an operating system, uh, but it's pretty locked down. If we go back to the main screen by pressing the power button, this is what we've got on here. And as you can see, there's an app market, but really that just has the four applications that were installed on the device. Um, so WPS Office, the Smart Oscilloscope, which is the actual software that we were using before, a file explorer software and then Mixig electronics tool and the electronics tool is quite nice it just has some very uh, simple calculators uh, to help get you by uh, if you can't remember it there is a browser as well which allows you to browse the internet although it's a little bit slow and the resolution on the screen is only 800 by 600 so you can't display um, some websites all that well and there is also a user guide uh, which is just a pdf of the user manual but it's there easily accessible on the main screen and then there is a general system upgrade and calculator and that kind of thing uh, you can connect to wi-fi uh, i don't think it has bluetooth in any way that's usable and you can also do things like screen capture so you can actually record video directly which can be handy for those people that make videos um, and if you're doing some work away from your lab where you don't want to plug it into the hdmi port uh, you can just record snapshots and videos directly so that's a quick look at the Mixig STO1004, a portable oscilloscope that you can carry with you, battery powered. So really quite a nice proposition because you can use this as your main uh, desktop scope. And we've got this beautiful display, uh, which is much larger than you see on most desktop oscilloscopes. So uh, really quite nice. The user interface, as I said, it's a little bit clunky at the start, but it doesn't take long to get used to where all the menus are and how to use it. Uh, and then it becomes uh, pretty easy to use. Uh, the only thing I would say really is that it's it's just really heavy. That's the, my only criticism of it. It's got really big lithium battery um, pack on it. And presumably there's some things like heat sinks and stuff that are contributing to the weight as well. And if you were carrying this around, um, you would... I mean, just me holding this slightly off the bench here is really giving me sort of arm ache. I think what would be nice along with this strap here would also be some kind of strap that you can attach to the top here that rests around your neck and then you could rest the tablet at the bottom on your belly or on your chest or something like that if you were working on a panel for example and you wanted to take some measurements because one-handed use of this uh, gets quite tiresome uh, really quickly but other than that it seems like a really nicely built oscilloscope I didn't really mention the build quality but this is you know it's really solid uh, there's no plasticiness, uh, no cheapness that you can really see from it. It just seems to be a, a really uh, well-built unit. So um, we gave an overview of all of the features, but I don't feel like that gives a proper review or uh, feeling for how the product actually is. So in the next videos where I've got some projects coming up, I think we're just going to use this in the way that it's intended to be used because in a review it's very easy to just say oh you know the features work nice uh, we've got all these different options and uh, blah 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 but I think until we use it in its intended uh, use it's very difficult to see how people can actually get on with it so uh, we've got a Christmas project that I'm recording um, in a couple of days time uh, that, that almost certainly will need some debugging so we'll be using uh, this oscilloscope then just to see how well it works uh, as part of that video. So I hope you found this video useful. A big thank you to Telonic Instruments uh, for supplying this for review. And if you are in the UK and you're looking for some test equipment, don't forget to look at the Telonic website. They also do rentals and um, they also have various clearance offers and that kind of stuff on there. We've used them professionally at work uh, quite a few times for rentals and it's always been uh, nice and easy to deal with. 
So I hope you enjoyed the video. Any thoughts or comments, don't forget to leave them in the comments section down below. Big thank you to my Patreon supporters, and until next time, thanks for watching.